it was really good wedding yesterday that some of us were at. I love weddings because um, just the people coming together and celebrating. And, uh, it's, you know, it's a time, I guess, when you can have more time with people than you normally can, uh, weddings. So they're just fantastic times. So today I'll be sharing from a passage in John 17. So if you want a title, that's my one. You can make up your own. That's just what I thought. Oh, this, this might work. But it's essentially about unity with God and others. So John 17, 20 to 21. And just before we read it, I'll give a little bit of context uh, to this passage. So uh, the John was written by the, the Apostle John. And... Uh, this chapter 17 is actually Jesus praying to the Father. So before that, um, Jesus has been talking to his disciples about the fact he's, he's going to leave them. I don't know if they fully understood what that meant, but he was going to send the Spirit and the, the church would start. And so in John 17, he's praying for the disciples. He's praying that they have unity, that they uh, just love one another. And actually, that is the way the world's going to know that they're his disciples. And so in these verses, it's a flow on from when Jesus is praying for his disciples. He actually prays for the church, for us. He prays for the rest of the believers from that time onwards. Um, this, this prayer, John 17, has been called like the priestly prayer or Jesus' greatest prayer. It's, it's a prayer, but it is a prayer that kind of shows God's Jesus' heart just before he's going to die and what he most wants for his church. Um, so we'll just pray and then we'll get into it. Lord, I thank you as we read your word, we learn about who you are and then we apply that to our lives. God, help us to have our ears and hearts to hear your word. Lord, help us to be challenged in how we live out our lives in faith and help us uh, to just be humble, Lord, in coming to you and asking you to change us into your image. In your name, amen. So this, oh, is the clicker up here? No clicker? Okay. So Chris, if I just like go that to you, cool. Great. All right. So this is John 17, 20 and 21. So my prayer, Jesus is praying, my prayer is not for them alone, the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Uh, and just before we start, the amazing thing again about this passage is Jesus is actually praying knowingly that I would become a Christian, that I'd believe the message, and all of you actually would become Christians. So Jesus is praying for us at this point. There's two types of unity in this passage that Jesus is praying for. And the first type is that they may be one. You know, Acts 2.42, as soon as Whoops, I don't need that one. As soon as uh, Peter has preached the first sermon, Acts 2.42 tells us that the church came together. They met constantly to hear the word of God, to share the common life, to break bread and to pray. So this unity that Jesus prayed for was for all Christians, including us today. Um, we would all be aware there are so many different denominations now and different ways that we... Christians practice their faith. But the unity Jesus is praying for is a fundamental unity that actually all Christians know who they are in Christ, that they are part of not just the local church, but the, the body of Christ, the global church. And, um, you know, that song that Kathy was singing, uh, I don't know the words, but the song that talks about all the nations kind of come before God. This is, I think, what Jesus had in mind. Revelation 7 9, there's that picture of people from every tribe and tongue coming together to worship God. That, that is what, when we think about heaven, actually, we're not thinking about a place so much as God's people coming together to worship him. Click. 
And the second, <laughs> we'll just work it out, we'll see what happens. The second type of unity, oh, sorry, can you go to the next one, please? Yeah, is that may they also be in us. So I've got up there participating in God, and, and there's a word perichosis, which I'll talk about a bit later. But Jesus was actually praying, not that just we would be united, but all of us would be united in God. That we would actually seek first and foremost to be, you know, to have the relationship that God has, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this word perichosis is about the intimacy that they have. God, Jesus actually prayed that we would have that with God. This deep connection that, that God shares. You know, when Jesus was on earth, he constantly went to the Father. He constantly prayed. He spent night times just praying and seeking God's will. And somehow Jesus prays that we will have that as well, that intimacy. So next one, please, Chris. So what... What I'll be talking about today is that we cannot have church, and I, I guess church, if we think really just about fellowship with Christians, without intimacy with God, and we cannot have intimacy with God without being with other Christians, without the church. Next one, Chris. So what does it mean to have church without intimacy with God? Because we've probably all seen kind of what that looks like. Chris. <laughs> it's a lot of work for you. There's like 20 slides. So I think this is a kind of a good summary. I just saw this on uh, Google or whatever. But it's, it's been a Sunday Christian, been a part-time Christian. So what this looks like in every day is, is church being a place where we meet our friends. And yes, it can be a place where we meet our friends. But for some people, that's what church is. Or it's church just being a place where we get refreshed because we've had a hard week. But, you know, by Sunday night, we're sort of just back into it. Like the week starts again and Christianity's kind of forgotten. It's like when we accept Christ into our lives and then we know we should go to church as someone told us to. But that's, that's what we think Christianity is about. We think it's just going to church. This would have made no sense to the church in the Bible. So in Acts 42... Again, I'll read that out. So after the first sermon, it says, they met constantly to hear the apostles teach, to share the common life, to break bread and to pray. So they met constantly. And one reason they did this was because they didn't have Zoom. So they weren't able to uh, log in and, and go online. They actually also didn't read. Most of them didn't read. And so to hear the word of God, they had to come together. And they wanted to do that so much that uh, I have actually read that many of the people who would have been in the early church would have been slaves. And they would have easily worked a 12-hour day, maybe longer. And then they were so desperate to hear God's word. They would walk, also no cars, maybe, who knows, half an hour, an hour to go to the church in the city. They were so keen to hear the gospel message that they constantly came together to hear this. Chris, next one. So without intimacy with God, this is essentially what we make church, and this actually breaks God's heart. I've used this slide before, so it's a good one. So it just becomes a social club. I don't know if you can read that. Without our own intimacy with God, church, you know, the best church in the world will not keep us because the point of church is not to, entertain us or to make us happy is to grow in intimacy with God so that we can do what we're singing about today so that we can share the witness to the world and actually this verse goes on I'll talk about it later Jesus says I want them to have intimacy so that the world will believe my story and think about what that means if we do not know God the world there's no story for us to tell the world if you look at church history just quickly, we have seen so often when the church loses intimacy with God. So, you know, before the Reformation, the church was a certain way and uh, God in his sovereignty, you know, allowed Martin Luther and others to, to 
come up with the idea or to rediscover the idea that we're justified by faith, not by the works we do, not by the rituals. So the church had a lot of rituals and traditions at that time. You know, if we are not intimate with God, if we don't, as pastor said, have our own prayer life, if we're not reading the Bible and growing in God, we will eventually stop being the church. We might still come on Sunday. We might still uh, be part of the WhatsApp groups and all that. But we actually lose our communion with God's body. Without intimacy with God, we can't be the church. Next one, Chris. I just thought this was a cool picture. I don't know if you can see it, but there's lots of human bodies that make up the church. A bit small, but that's what it says. You know, this the church is founded by God, and it will continue by God's grace. It's not actually we continue. It's the Holy Spirit who guides and continues the church. But as I said, we actually stop being a part of it once we lose that connection with God. One of the blessings of this century, and Foursquare is a Pentecostal church, and one of the blessings of Pentecostal and also uh, charismatic churches has been just a desire to see God present in the church again, to see the Holy Spirit uh, doing things when we come together, to, to actually believe that God wants to be intimate with us when we gather. And did you know there are actually charismatics all across the church body? Uh, there are people who believe that when we meet, God's with us and the Spirit wants to do things in the Anglican Church, in the Presbyterian, in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has even had some kind of charismatic revival of sorts. So the first point is you cannot have church without intimacy with God. And really what I mean by that is we can still meet, churches still meet every day, but when the people are not close to God, they're not actually being the church. They're not actually being God's body. Chris? So the next point is what does intimacy with God without the church, maybe my English is bad, what does it mean to be intimate with God but not be a part of the church? So this looks like Christians who... You know, they love God so much, but they're not keen on other Christians because Christians upset them. Christians make mistakes. Christians even sin sometimes. It looks like the Christian who who moves churches every two months because they're offended or because uh, they just don't agree with the pastor's preaching or the food at the end of the service was not that good. Most churches don't even have food at the end of the service, so... You'd be silly to complain about that here. It actually looks like the Christian who understands that we are justified by faith, so we are brought into right relationship with God, but they don't understand the whole relational side of who God is, the relational side of what it means to be a Christian. Again, in the early church, this would not have been possible. You couldn't have become a Christian and then just stayed at home and gone on Zoom. Not so much because there's no Zoom, but because you didn't read. So you wouldn't have been able to hear the gospel if you didn't gather with other Christians. In Acts 42, they met together, praying and eating together. I would suggest out of these two errors, that it is more likely nowadays that Christians would have intimacy with God, but not be a part of a church. And that's solely because we, we're an individualistic society. And I'm probably talking more about Western society here. But we live in an individual society so different to that of the early church. Chris? So I, I like sport. Um, and this, this man, he used to play for my team up until the end of 2020. He's a pretty good player. and He's just representative of what happens in so many sports now, that players, they play for a team, and then next time you see them, they're wearing a different uniform, and all their mates from last year, they now hate, and all the people they used to, like, get into fights with on the footy field, they're now best friends with. So they change uniform, and suddenly, uh, you know, they're a completely different person. It happens a lot, and uh, might be lots of reasons, but probably the main reason is, is money, okay? They get paid more to go somewhere else. That was not this guy's fault. Actually, this guy was 
he was told by his club they didn't have any money to give him, so he had to go. But lots of players change because they just, uh, you know, want more money. And I don't blame them. That is, it is symptomatic of how our society is, isn't it? People will chase the dollar. It's an individualistic society. But let's just look at what this com- how this compares to what Christianity is actually about. Chris? So uh, today we'll talk a bit about the Corinth, the church in Corinth, or the the letter to the Corinthians, uh, because they had a real issue with unity. So this is what Paul said to them. He said, For though I am free with respect to all, I've made myself a slave or a servant to all, so that I might win more of them. So Paul was saying, I could do things my way. I'm actually free to do so. But I make myself a slave so that I might be a witness, so I might win more people. And again, salvation is about that we're justified by faith. That is true. But do you know what? The relational side of who God is and salvation tells us why we have been saved. We've been saved for intimacy with God and we've been saved to actually serve in his body, to serve alongside other Christians. I just want to uh, quickly explore what it means to... um, I've got a picture here, Chris. So this picture uh, is maybe a little bit hard to see, but it was from from fairly early church history. And a word before I mentioned about perichosis, this, this picture is meant to show it. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you look at their faces, I don't know how well you can see it, but they're meant to be all kind of looking at each other and their bodies are all pointed to each other. Uh, Chris, next one. So this word, uh, perichrosis, actually means from the Greek word peri, which is around, and chorea, which means to dance. So the, I guess what happened in the early church, they tried to understand who God is, because even though the Bible talks about who God is, they had to work out what does that actually mean. And they came up with this idea that God is a relational being where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are constantly in communion. And surely Jesus showed us on earth uh, some of what that looks like. And it's hard for us as humans to kind of grasp that intimacy because we all have fallen relationships. But they said God is like this three persons in one who's constantly communicating, constantly dancing around, talking, being with each other. So it is true we are justified by faith, but the goal of salvation is that we are drawn into this relationship. The Apostle Peter said in 2 Peter 1.4 that we actually become participants of this divine nature. There is some mystery in this, that we actually become part of that picture, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a table, so there's four sides to the table. And in some sense, we are actually drawn to that table. So when we are in Christ, we are actually partaking in what is happening. Absolutely, we we never become God, so I'm not saying that. But what the gospel writers try to wrestle with is, how, what does it mean to be in Christ? Like, How do I get drawn into who God is? How do we actually become his body? Like, We're the living, breathing, breathing image of God. So if we have intimacy with God, if we get to know God and we learn his relational, he's a relational God, and we are made in his image, because we are made in his image, we are also relational. We are made for community. If we are intimate with God, if we know him, then I promise we will be drawn into relationship with other Christians. It's impossible not to. And vice versa is true. When we are struggling with our relationship with God, when we're not walking day by day with God, church and Christians become hard work because they they just grate on us and we find the same problems in the church as in outside the church and we're like, what's what is it with these guys? But when we are close to God, we are necessarily drawn in because that's who God is. We cannot know God and say, I'll I'll just be an island to myself. I won't be with 
God's community because he is relational. Chris? We're about halfway through, so you're doing well. So I just want to talk just a little bit about the church. And this has been helpful for me. Uh, if it's helpful for you, you know, take it on board. If not, that's okay. So I've got up there, uh, you know, in the early creeds, they talk about the church being one apostolic global church. And just what they meant by that is that God's body is one. We are one with all the other Christians who have been since Jesus was here. We are part of them. And it is, it is true that we both need to be part of the local church because relationships, we're talking about relationships, that happens in the local church. We get to know people. We get annoyed by people. We forgive them, pray for them, learn from them, all those things. But we also learn so much from thinking about the church as being God's body of believers. I've just got here a little thing about, uh, you know, the church upstairs. When we were coming in this morning, they were singing a song, kind of, it seemed to be in another language maybe. Anyway, Melky thought it was quite a funny one. But this is, this is actually our body. They worship a little bit differently to us, but this is God's body. Probably more challenging for us is if we went to an Anglican church or a Catholic church or a church with a different denomination, and they can be very uh, somber, very serious. You know, Anglicans dangle their perfume, something like that. Um, they're very serious. Actually, oh, I'll just, just hear a little funny story. The... Back when I was much younger, there was a girl I liked, and she went to a, um, I think, an Anglican school. And uh, it was my first experience of Christianity in a very serious. No one clapped. No one got up and sang the song. So they all just, like, chanted. You know, the, part, the pastor says something, and they know what to say next. And that, that was a real turn off probably from the relationship. But it didn't turn me off Christianity. But it was quite a shock to me. But in this... When we look at how other Christians are, I would just encourage you to think, is there some part of God that I can discover when I see how other Christians are, the way they worship? We, we come here partly because we're drawn by the way we worship, a kind of a spirit experience. But we're also part of a bigger body. And when we get to heaven, not everyone is going to be like you or me. There's going to be people from a whole range of cultures, countries, worshipping God in their own way. Um, and so we can actually learn from the rest of the body of Christ. At the very least, Jesus says, I want them to be one. So why does this matter? So next one. This passage goes on to tell us. Oh, sorry, next one. Might have gone back. I'm not sure. So John 17 22. So this follows up for why Jesus says, Father, please give them unity as a body and unity with God. It is so that the world might know that you sent me. It is actually our witness is our unity with God and unity with other Christians. This is what the world sees. Jesus actually gives permission to the world to accept him or not based on the unity of his people. Unity amongst God's people helps the world to believe that the Father sent Jesus. The, uh, a writer, Carson, said it like this. He says, Jesus looks beyond our unity to the unconverted world out there that stands in need of the witness that we generate by our unity. This word um, in John 17, 21, it talks about the message of the, of the um, believers. And that message uh, is the word logos, which can also be like the word or the witness of the believers. And so Jesus is saying when, when we are one with him and when we have unity amongst ourselves, somehow the world actually understands that the message we speak is true. If we do not know God and we don't have unity amongst ourselves, then the world will really struggle to believe the message. Why should they? 
So Jesus is saying, Father, please give them unity and help them to be united with me, with God, because that is what the world will believe. Next one. Oh, hello. We've changed. <laughs> you know, this has always been God's plan. There was a, a poet in the 17th century said this famous line, no man is an island, or no, no person is an island unto himself in prophet speak now. And Paul said in Romans 4, 17, 14, 7, no one lives for themselves and no one dies for themselves. God first chose a people, the people of Israel, as a community. They were his, uh, the word Bible used the word elect. They were elected by God. And you know what? This is what the church is. The difference is now we have the Holy Spirit living inside us and we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. But in some ways also there's, there is some continuation and it's helpful to understand the biblical plan. God has always chosen a people to represent himself to the world. And now that's who we are, the church. So Jesus wants us to understand who we are, not just as a local congregation, which is very important, also as part of the bigger body of Christ. You know, ideally, it should look like this. When we are one with God, we're one with others. So it's like two, two kind of hands coming together and being solid. Uh, the reality is, though, we know sometimes that doesn't always work. It doesn't always look like this. And there's, there's, there's quite a lot of reasons why, and it's, I'm not going to go into that today, but I just want to, I guess, encourage. You guys are watching quite interesting stuff up there. I want to encourage a way that we can seek unity in our differences. Pretty close. I reckon the next one. Yeah. So as Pastor has shared sort of towards the end of last year, uh, you know, being offended is not an uncommon thing. It happens in church that people offend us. It's going to happen in the world anyway. Uh, and actually, you know, in my, in my mental health job, one of the things I always think when, especially when people are telling me, you know, a story about how they've been hurt by someone, let down by the government, their wife, husband, neighbor, whatever. I always have in my mind, you know, all of us get offended. We all get hurt. That just makes you human. But how you respond to that offense really matters. And in Jesus' words, he says, he prays for unity so that the world might believe that you sent me. He knew that it would be a struggle to be united. He knew that this unity would always be there. And I guess recently when we look at America, but in reality, lots of countries throughout history, there is so much disunity. It is a shame when the world looks at the church and sees the same thing that they see in the world. It means that we cannot be a witness of who God is when we look like the same as in, in the world. And I've heard, I'm not sure how true this is, but some of the churches in America are really struggling with unity in this time because of different, I guess, kind of political persuasions and ways of looking at what's happening. You know, we can't be united through our own efforts. Seeking unity with each other without actually knowing God, it just doesn't work, and it is really hard. It was never meant to be like that. As a, as a New Testament church, we're empowered by the Spirit. How ridiculous that we would try to live like loving everyone here without the Spirit helping us. It's just too hard. I'm, not, I'm far from perfect, so I admit for me it's probably too hard. But for all of us, it's probably a real challenge. We need to be empowered by the Spirit. But you know what? In our unity, we absolutely need diversity. We are not all the same. We all have different strengths. God chose only to make one of me because he thought the world doesn't need another one. He, he made lots of different people, but only one of me. And the reason is that by myself, I am not the totality of what it means to be the body of Christ. 
only when I'm in relationship with other Christians can I be God's body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. So Paul speaking to the Corinthian church who are struggling with their own gifts, which gift is better, and, you know, all this unity stuff. He says, we are the body of Christ, and each one is a part in it. We are the body. Everyone has a part, but together we are God's body. We don't need more of me. And actually, it's the same with all of us. God has chosen only to make one of all of us. He made us uniquely in our role in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 13 goes on to, you know, a very famous book about love. Love is the foundation of how we come together. Love is the foundation of our unity. Love is actually what compels us to embrace the fact that we are different and to unite together. I just I had a few pointers in terms of how we're different. And then I'm going to suggest that in these differences we actually celebrate and unite. So, one, I've noticed. Actually, Kathy and me used to be in a prayer team where we used to have to pray through a whole service. So when I say have to, it wasn't terrible, but 90 minutes. That was quite a challenge. Every time we'd ask our friends to join us, no one ever would. Or well, they might come once maybe and, you know, that was too long. Some people can pray for a long time. For others, that's a real challenge. They pray for a short time. But actually, let's celebrate the fact that the way we communicate to God is different. If you look throughout the Bible, there's so many different prayers. Some of them are heart prayers, just saying, God, help me. God, I need you. Other people are very, uh, very proper in how they pray. They pray with the right words and it all sounds very nice. Let's celebrate it. We all pray differently. Some people are very busy people. They're constantly doing things. That's not me. I'm, a, I'm someone who's probably more contemplative and I like to think things through. But actually the body of Christ needs all these people combined. Let's celebrate it. Some people love to speak. Once they have a microphone, like Melky, a bit hard to get it out of his hands. He just loves to speak, loves to sing, loves to have a mic. But actually other people are great listeners. You know, we, we need people who can just sit down and listen as well. Let's celebrate that. We don't need to all be the same. God has made us differently. Some people can dance. Some people are art artistic. We used to have a girl at a church we went to who, during the worship, she'd just do like a painting. And it was just amazing. Not only was she artistic, but she was moving in the spirit. No one ever asked me to do that because I can't. Some people are more extroverted and some are more introverted. It's okay. Let's celebrate that. We need those differences. And the last one for me is that some people can cook food. I cannot cook food very well, but I do love to eat food. I'm just not that interested in cooking. I just, I like to eat. Yeah, amen. But let's celebrate that. You know, we need shows like Master Chef, but if that was all that was on the TV, I'd throw my TV out. I just, you know, it doesn't, doesn't excite me. However God has made us, we are the church only as we are empowered by the Spirit in unity. Actually, drawing near to God will mean we draw near to other Christians. Being part of the body of Christ is also essential for drawing near to God. And, the, and Jesus said to the Father, why this matters? He didn't say, although it's true that if we are in unity, we will like each other more and it will have more fun in church. But he actually said, so that the world will know that what I said is true in our unity. It is our witness to the world, and probably more and more, it is a stronger witness now because there is so much disunity and brokenness and loneliness in the world that our unity with each other and with God is our witness. Can the worship team come back up? And I'll just finish.
So I've looked at the fact that we can't have church. We can't be with other Christians without intimacy with God. And that we cannot draw close to God without being drawn to be a part of his body. These things are meant to go hand in hand like this. We find that church without intimacy with God doesn't work. We are not the church anymore. The encouragement is that Jesus prayed to the Father, I want them to know me. I want them to know the intimacy that the Father and the Son have. Look, we, it is even hard for us to understand what that intimacy is like. But that was his prayer because he knew that intimacy with God, intimacy, union with other Christians is the way that this church grows. It's the way the global church grows. I'll just finish off with this picture. Is there one more slide? Oh, another person, Ken. That might, I'm not sure that might be the last one. You know, Paul uses this image as the body of Christ. It's one of his, he has a number of images he uses to represent the church. This image of the body is just so fantastic. We're all a different part. We're the arm, the leg, the eye, the ear, the hands. There's amazing diversity in the body. Only God could think about that. All the parts are so important. All the parts are so important in the church. And it's when we recognize that, that helps us to unite. None of us have a more important role. We all have an important role. But for the arm to work and the leg to work and the eye and the ear, we need to have intimacy with God. Once my arms, oh, actually I did hurt my foot recently and it really impacts on my whole life because every time I walk, I don't want to run anymore because it's painful. And so in the body of Christ, whatever part we are, it is being healthy. Being in relationship with God means we can do our part well. And just finally, this was Jesus' prayer just before he dies. He knows that he's going to send the Spirit and this new body of Christ will be formed, his body. The body that actually he wants to present to the Father. You know, Jesus loves us so much that he wants to present us as an unblemished body to the Father. And he says this about his body. If you are healthy, if you love each other and you know God, that is your witness. Let's pray and then we'll sing. Thank you, Lord, for uh, just your amazing words in this prayer, Lord, that you, you saw into the future. You saw believers believing in the word, the gospel, and coming together. And your prayer was that the Father unites them. God, we pray that we make every effort through the Spirit to love one another, to be united, not to cause division, to actually accept our differences, the way you've made us, our personalities, to accept those as this wonderful part of a healthy body. We are who you've made us to be. And God, let us know, let us meditate on it, that our witness to the world is our love, our unity for each other. Thank you, Lord. Amen.